Stanford University. When I first came to Stanford 11 years ago, uh, we arrived in the summer of uh, 2000, and I walked around campus, and I saw a lot of kids. I saw sports camps, cheerleading camps, technology camps, math camps, science camps, every kind of camp for kids you could imagine. But I asked myself, where are the teachers? Here's this incredible resource in the middle of the Bay Area, and I can't see any teachers. So 11 years later, you can see how much has changed. And it makes me um, extraordinarily happy to see you all here today and to have the kind of presence that you have. CSET, the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching, was founded as part of Stanford's K-12 initiative. And we're a research design and development uh, center that both offers various forms of professional development, such as you're participating in this next couple of weeks, and also conducts work research on how best to support high quality teaching. We believe that investing in teachers and in teaching is the key to solving the problems of K-12 education, and really the only thing that's gonna work in the long run. We believe we cannot create better outcomes for kids unless we pr pr provide opportunities for teachers to continue learning and to continue improving their craft from the very onset of their career with the mentoring program that we offer for beginning teachers through support for um, very experienced and accomplished teachers as well. So we're proud to uh, offer the range of programs that we do and excited about, again, your presence today and what it represents for our center. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Lee Shulman. It's quite hard to know how to introduce someone that I've known for so long and in so many different ways, because Lee started out as my graduate school advisor. <laughs> and when I graduated with my PhD, he told me that it came with a lifetime guarantee. I didn't really know what that meant when he provided that guarantee, but I've since come to learn that that includes lifetime advice and counsel on any particular professional or personal matter that uh, seems to come up, attendance at my children's bar and bat mitzvahs, and most recently, Lee is my tutor for my own bat mitzvah that's happening in October. So this is what we mean by a lifetime guarantee. But beyond that, Lee is so well known in the world of research on teaching that again, he hardly needs an introduction. It's especially meaningful for us that Lee agreed to be the keynote speaker for this first day of SSTI because Lee has devoted most of his career to the support of excellence in teaching. He founded, when he was at Michigan State, he founded the Institute for Research on Teaching that looked at the complexity of teachers' decision making and moved the field towards a greater recognition of the professionalism that's involved in teaching. He then went on to do the foundational work for the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards here at Stanford and created the first prototypes for the National Board. He went on to become the president of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching where he created the Carnegie Academy for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. It was the first time, I think, in the Foundation's history that Lee actually brought K-12 teachers to the Foundation to investigate and document their own teaching and then make that work public to others. Central to every aspect of Lee's career has been the efforts, in Andrew Carnegie's words, to encourage, uphold, and dignify the profession of the teacher. For this work, he has been awarded almost every award conceivable. I won't go through the whole list, but it includes the Grawmeyer Award in Education, multiple awards for AD, from AERA, the E.L. Thorndike Award from the American Psychological Association, and numerous honorary documents. So please join me in welcoming Lee Shulman. Thank you, Pam. I began the day this morning at 9 o'clock uh, 
the sort of thing you, you do when you've retired twice and have failed both retirements <laughs> is that people invite you to do this sort of thing. And so at 9 this morning, I greeted the entering STEP class, the Stanford Teacher Education Program class of, are there any STEP graduates here? All right. Uh, a program which I taught from 1982 to 1997 or 8, before moving to Carnegie, a program where Pam served as a teaching assistant before she went off to Seattle and then came back to teach in the program. Uh, and it was very lovely to, to stand in front of nearly a hundred bright-eyed, young, mostly, uh, well, it's a second career for some, uh, enthusiastic, excited folks just embarking on the journey that you're in the midst of now. Uh, and now I come here at lunch, see this group of grizzled, worn-down veterans, <laughs> except that you, you'll look awfully excited and enthused and motivated as well. And uh, it's, it's a nice way, I'm, I'm thinking of going over to a nursing home for retired <laughs> teachers this evening. It just seems like a symmetrical trifecta of sorts. Um, I, I might have asked you for suggestions, but I'm afraid you'd have one. Uh, so I think I'll just look in the mirror when I get home. Uh, one of the many things that Pam and I share uh, is uh, watching a particular program on the Food Channel called Chopped. How you like Chopped? Okay. How many of you know about Chopped? Okay, mostly the step students. Uh, anyway, <laughs> Chopped is a program where experienced chefs, chefs are given mystery ingredients that they did not know we're going to be in their basket ahead of time, and they're given four at a time, out of which first they've got to make an appetizer course in, in 20 minutes, and then a main course in 30 minutes or something, I don't know, and then a dessert, so they get... And I sometimes ask myself, why do Pam and I like this program so much? And I figure Pam and I, one, th one of the things we share, in addition to her bat mitzvah, uh, so keep chanting, kid. It's a, is, um, is that whatever we see anywhere reminds us of teaching. And what could be more like teaching than chopped? I mean, think of it this way. At the beginning of each year, you get a surprise basket. In it are three new pieces of curriculum that you'd never taught before. And then 30 kids, unless you're teaching in high school, in which case it might be 150 or 160, or 170, depending upon which budget Mr. Brown ends up signing. Um, and somehow you have to take this set of mystery ingredients and transform it magically into classes where teaching and learning go on with enormous exuberance and persistence. Uh, it is an act of magic. It really is quite remarkable. And uh, I spent over 10 years as a faculty member uh, in medical school and uh, did a lot of research on how physicians do their work. And you know, people like brain surgeons think they have a hard job. They've never taught third grade. <laughs> I mean, can you? We do brain surgery. They do brain surgery, okay? They do brain surgery on one patient at a time. And they have a co-teacher called, called an anesthesiologist who puts the patient to sleep. <laughs> or numbs them. Did you ever hear of a surgeon who had a management problem? <laughs> then they've got nurses and more junior physicians and surgeons all around them. And they get to work on one person's head. We have to work on all of our students' heads. By and large, we do it alone. We don't put them to sleep. In fact, it would be <laughs> counterproductive. Well, yeah, OK. <laughs> Are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> One of the things I love about teaching over the internet is for years, as a teacher, I always taught, and I had to worry about the students going to sleep. 
now my students have to be awake and I can be sleeping. Uh, that, the internet stuff, so really a great advantage. Now, it, it, our job is much more difficult. We, uh, our students don't elect to come to us. I mean, there are a whole variety of ways in which the work we do is the most demanding, the most taxing, the most challenging uh, of any profession on the planet. Uh, so Pam asked me to come speak to you about it. And so I, I found myself doing chopped again. You know how sometimes when you're cooking uh, and you got to cook something for dinner, you go into the pantry and you see what's there. You open the fridge and say, okay, three eggs, a little cheese, a little leftover, right? Okay. You say, what can I put together with this? So I found myself a few weeks ago, sitting at my desk, looked at my calendar, and I saw Talk for Pam. That's what it was. I, I personalize these things, Pam. And I said, okay, what do I want to talk about with a group of terrific teachers across a number of programs uh, that would not bore them out of their minds and might even be a little bit helpful? And the first thing I did was I looked on my desk and I saw two pieces of text. It was like going into the pantry. Or, there were two things in the fridge that I had recently read totally independently and had just loved reading. And so I set myself the chop challenge. Can I talk to you about these two pieces of text which you will soon see are not about teaching in the narrow sense, and have it result in something that might be of interest and even potentially of value to all of us. So we're playing Chopped. The first thing on my desk, and something that may be the most important thing you learn all week, is a book by a professor of literature who is also a psychoanalyst teaching at the Sorbonne in Paris. His name is Pierre Bayard. You're nodding. Do you know the book I mean? You do. I thought so. It's called How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read. <laughs> now, I actually talked about this book to the new teacher education students this morning. And I asked them, I said, look, let's face it, if you've gotten this far, you've all got one or two degrees, odds are you're already very good at this. <laughs> right? You know, the, the, uh, one of the lines in here is, you know, have you read such and such a book? Read it? I haven't even taught it. You know. <laughs> okay. Um, you haven't been on the Stanford campus long enough. Uh, <laughs> I ask them how many of them have not had the experience of having to either make a presentation or write a paper about a book they hadn't had time to read and still got an A for the paper. Only one student raised their hand. And I said, you've never done this? And he said, no, I've done it, but I think I've got a B plus. <laughs> now, the book is a very serious book. The book is a very serious book. And it's something that, that is a response to experiences that all of us have had, both from the production and from the consumption end. I mean, I'll give you an example. Many times I've had the experience, somebody coming up to me and saying, Dr. Schulman, I love your work. I especially liked the piece you wrote about such and such. They name an article. And the point I loved the most that you made in that article was X, Y, Z. And I smile and I nod and I'm thinking to myself, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> I do remember writing that piece. A, I don't remember ever writing that. B, if I wrote it, that couldn't possibly be what I intended them to take away. 
and C, maybe they're just confusing me with somebody else, which has happened. But notice what's happened now. Somebody has read something you wrote. And they tell you how much they learned from it, and then they express it in ways that don't bear any resemblance to what it is you thought you wrote. Now look, you're all veteran teachers. Don't tell me that you have not had a similar experience as a teacher, where you teach your heart out about something. Any biology teachers here? Just a few. Um, biology teachers reg regularly teach about evolution and natural selection. And then they'll give exams to the students where the students have to state in their own words what the principles are. And almost universally, the kids have imposed their own prior conceptions of, frankly, intelligent design. It may, may not need any, any supernatural source, but they don't get it, even though they may have gotten all of the exercises right. But we have that when we teach novels. We have that when we teach history. And yet, it's always a surprise. It's always a surprise. What is a delightful surprise is when the person who misconstrues what you've written tells you what they learned and it's far better than anything you originally wrote. <laughs> no, I mean, just that somehow reading what you wrote interacted with what they had in their pantry. And instead of producing a kind of pedestrian stew, in their heads it became an expansive and delightful intellectual souffle that soared, whereas you had given them some pretty pedestrian ideas. I think Bayard's point is that nobody ever really reads a book in some simple one-to-one -one sense. Any more than teaching, any time we do it, is a simple linear connection between what I say and what you hear, or if you've got a highly interactive classroom, what one student says and another student hears and another student makes out of it. And as these ideas go around, you know, the most wonderful classrooms are classrooms where an initial germ of an idea begins to get worked on and massaged and, 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 and fertilized and expanded and battered about by the students so that 25 minutes later something quite unpredictable and quite rich and wonderful has happened. And even though we as teachers may feel, just as we as authors do, that at a very early point in that process we lost control, uh, it empowered other people to take control, to take responsibility, and to act on what we were, we were teaching. But again, how do you respond when you know a student has not read the text? They may have just read the first page. And you ask them a question about the text, and they give you an absolutely splendid response. Splendid. Compared to another student who's read every, every word of the text, and what they give back to you is sort of like, did you ever ask a four-year-old who just came back from a movie what the movie was about? You know what you get? Yeah, okay. And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, then the big smile, the end. And yet the student who hadn't read the whole text somehow knew enough to blend their understanding with whatever they had, what they knew about the, perhaps the genre, what other things they knew that were related to it, and put together an account that was really quite lovely. Now, does that mean that they haven't done the assignment? Or does that mean that they have truly learned? 
how to talk about a book they haven't read. I mean, in the, in, in the days of Google and Internet, let's think about the world we and our students live in. How often, as we work through texts in the Internet, do we move from the middle of one text to the middle of another? Because that's where the links occur, right? Where very rarely do we read an entire text from beginning to end. Are we supposed to feel guilty about that? Are our students supposed to feel guilty about it? Or, in fact, is one of the most important things we can learn and we can teach our students is how to make sense of books they haven't, in the traditional sense, read. And how do we tell the difference between going beyond the information given, between the power of interpretation, of inference, of really marrying what you know with what's in the text as a very higher order cognitive accomplishment and simple old fashioned BSing, which I'm told we're supposed to discourage. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, again, I think there is intelligent exercise of that talent, and there is corrupting exercise of the talent. And one of the kinds of judgments that we as teachers have to make is which is which? Is which is which? So that was one of the texts I had on my desk. How to talk about books you haven't read. And it really led me to think about this in the context of teaching more generally. And I must say, now, Bayard is a, is a psychoanalyst. And so I didn't read the book he wrote, I have to confess. Because Bayard, well, no, I never read the book. Nobody reads books I write either. I mean, in that sense. <laughs> you read it, you bring to bear your own interests and connections and analogies and, and history, and you extract from the book what you want to extract, and as long as you're not, the, the writer of the book isn't giving you a multiple choice exam at the end, which is an examination of how well you were able to figure out what the writer wanted you to figure out, that's perfectly legitimate. And so I, you know, Bayard's argument is that when you read a text, when you read a book, in effect, you're reading yourself. Because to understand the book is to understand the exquisite interaction between which part of this was me coming to terms with the book and which part was the book reaching, triggering, stimulating me. That's very pretty too. I mean, that's very lovely. Again, one of the nice things about a good book is that there, you buy one book and it's as many books as different people read it. And so, for me, it was all about the act of imagination, of going beyond the text, of combining the me ingredient and the book's ingredients into new meanings and new interpretations, and our challenge of helping students learn to do that. Learn to do that. Do it responsibly, inventively, creatively, and ultimately in a generative way that prepares them to learn more and more stuff. The fellow who wrote one of the reviews of this book wrote a wonderful review. He talked about what a great book it was. And at the end he said, but ultimately the book left me in a state of great ambivalence because I had to look in the mirror and ask myself, did I really have to read the book in order to write a review of it? <laughs> <laughs> but you see, this is kind of the paradox you're with. So what was the other piece of text that was sitting in front of me? I've printed it out, but in fact, it was on my screen. Uh, a blog from the Daily New York Times. And the title of the blog was Speaking Up for Patient Safety and Survival, Better Hand Washing Through Technology by Tina Rosenberg. It was two blogs separated by two days. 
hand washing. Interesting, interesting topic. It turns out that the fourth greatest cause of death in America annually is hospital-borne infections. Infections you don't have when you go into the hospital and you get in the hospital. The numbers are staggering. One out of every 20 patients who, is, who goes to the hospital and you know, becomes a, an inpatient ends up getting a hospital-borne infection. That's approximately 2 million infections a year. 100,000 people a year die of these infections. Staggering number. And the cost to our already overburdened healthcare system is 30 to 40 billion dollars a year. So I mentioned these figures uh, just to make it clear this is a non-trivial question. What makes it paradoxical is that the solution to this problem does not require MRIs and PET scans and all of the high voltage, high cost technologies, surgeries, uh, experimental medications that we think of as adding cost to health care. It's washing hands. The single most important thing that everybody who has any encounter with a patient, physicians, nurses, other health care personnel, their families need to do is wash their hands or use the alcohol rubs obsessively, obsessively, before and after every single encounter with the patient. The single most dramatic example of this was a little bit more complicated, and it was the rate of infection with something called central line catheters. You know about your nurse? No, okay. I mean, we do have nurses who are teaching too. Uh, it's an important catheter that is used regularly in ICUs, both to draw blood and to uh, uh, put in medications. And in some ICUs, the infection rate around that kind of catheter insertion, which is usually inserted in the groin, is 35%. And so a group of physicians and nurses sat down using the information they already had and developed something like a five-step checklist of things that had to be done or not done in conjunction with that one procedure. And it had to do almost entirely with sterilization and with not reusing certain catheters in certain ways. And they did an experimental study in which they systematically applied this checklist at a group of hospitals in Michigan. The infection rate dropped to zero. Zero! By introducing a set of routine, I won't say mindless, but they didn't require talking about a text you hadn't read. They talked about taking the text seriously and taking one another seriously, because one of the other things they did was they said that everybody on the team is responsible for everybody else's work. And so if the nurse on the team sees the senior surgeon violating any step of the checklist, he or she must step up and say, doctor, please wash your hands. And the, the, she can stop the process. In other words, it's like somebody on an assembly line who can pull the switch. 
and say, the line stops, I don't care how many cars we don't manufacture in the next hour until this happens. So it was a combination of routinization, of habituation, of commitment to doing a simple thing or set of things religiously, and a collective empowerment of members of the community to feel collectively responsible for the quality of the work rather than individually responsible. So those were my two texts. Those were my two texts. How do we bring them together? Well, one way I think we bring them together is through reflecting on our own work as teachers. Because there are few roles that combine, on the one hand, the need for almost boundlessly inventive, creative, spontaneity in practice and in performance as teaching does. We never do cross the same river twice. And on the other hand, developing and practicing quite strict routines. I still remember a number of years ago, uh, Gail Leinhart and James Greeno were both on the faculty of the University of Pittsburgh. Greeno later joined our faculty here at Stanford. And they were asking in 1985 some questions about what distinguished unusually effective elementary school math teachers from those that were quite un ineffective. And they went in and they observed for days on end. And one of their major conclusions was two words, homework check. What they found was one of the things that consistently happened in the classrooms of the unusually effective math teachers. They all danced the same dance. The choreography overall was the same. Start the class by checking homework, finding out what the kids had had trouble with, with the problem sets they'd been given the night before. Then go over that, then teach some new stuff, often with kids at the board. We know the dance, okay? And then get them ready with the new problem set for the next math day. The less effective math teachers were taking at least half of the class time to review the homework from the day before. It just took them forever. They didn't have a routine. They didn't really have a plan. So neither they nor the kids were grooved into a routine. And even then, when they were all done with using half the class for homework check, they really didn't have a good grasp on what the kids knew and what they didn't know. But not only half the class was left, so they had to rush through the instruction and then give the kids the next set of problems for which they were not yet adequately prepared because there hadn't been enough time for instruction. And you get the, you know, what we call the, the mathematical death spiral. Okay? No, you get further and further. You all know this. The teachers who were unusually effective had a drill. They had a routine. They were able to do homework check within the first five to eight minutes of class. The kids knew their role, the teacher knew his or her role, and they were into new instruction before the 10 minute mark. It was routine, it was habit, it was checklist. These were enormously inventive teachers, but they knew to render onto habit that which is habit and routine and render into innovation and novelty what really needs the innovation and novelty. And they didn't confuse the two. And that's what I see in the medical example. I mean, medicine actually is like that as well. If you talk with good physicians about doing physical exams during morning rounds, I don't know if any of you have spent much time in hospitals. I hope not as patients, but maybe you have. Every morning, it's like Groundhog Day. You know, remember that movie? It's all the same thing. You know, they wake you out of a sound sleep at six o'clock in the morning and ask how well you slept. Uh, they, 
Uh, but then there are certain, you know, they do their history. It's always the same kind of history. They do the physical exam. Then, you know, more people come. Uh, it's, it's, if, if you want to teach students a physical exam, you teach them a physical exam they can do in 10 minutes or less. It's highly, highly routinized. And yet, any time there is something unusual that happens, they stop and they branch off and they begin a new inquiry. So you've got routine, the routine of the rounds, the routine of the physical exam, but embedded in it is what we as teachers call teachable moments that the physicians think of as moments in which they have to shift from routine to inquiry and a very different process begins. But you can't do teaching or medicine without having enormous respect for both. You can't say, and some of the very best work in this area is being done by the young lady on my right, that we don't train teachers, we don't, teachers don't need to rehearse and practice aspects of teaching because in fact we do. An enormous amount of what we need to do, we need to practice again and again and again so it becomes skilled, automatic. And it's like the old joke about how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. And on the other hand, we need lots and lots of support to be inventive and innovative. But we also have to recognize that just as the texts just as the texts are never really read, that we and our students are also like texts to one another. Every one of our students is a text that we will never have a chance to read through. To use Don Norman's metaphor, when a teacher and a student meet, it's like an encounter between two icebergs in the ocean. All we see of each other is the tip. Often what really counts and will sink the other if we're not careful is the huge bulk that's invisible beneath the surface. And we've got to get smarter and smarter both in trying to make inferences from what we can see to what we can't see, but also to give our students as much help as we can so they can learn to read both us and the texts we assign, not leaving it as a mystery. I mean, I still remember teaching in our STEP program a number of years ago, and uh, the students were re writing cases of their own teaching. And one student had written a case based on teaching the world history course at a local high school. Anybody here still teaching world history? Okay. A lot of history to teach. Do you get a whole year or just a semester? You get a year. Okay, you, they could ask you to do it in a semester, you know. Uh, no. And so we used to call that course from Plato to NATO. I don't know what they call it now. <laughs> but she had three days for the Protestant Reformation. But I, you know, I think the Renaissance got four. So it's, <laughs> the Civil War gets two weeks, but you know, it's not US history, it's a different course. Anyway. And we were talking about surprises. And she said, well, I had one. Uh, she is such a good teacher, she got through the Reformation in two and a half periods, not three. And so there was half a period for discussion. And she said, well, is there anything people want to ask me about the Reformation? And a student in the back of the room raised his hand and said, you know, I understand all about the Reformation, about Martin Luther being a kind of renegade priest and revolting against the Pope and uh, writing out his theses and nailing them to the door of the cathedral and all. I mean, that's all very clear. She said, so what's the question? He said, well, I just don't get how we could spend an entire unit on Martin Luther and never talk about his I have a dream speech. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but it's a word. Remember, it's Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, you know? Olivia Newton, Olivia Newton Johns. I mean, you know, what's the. It seems so obvious to us. 
And yet the kids don't have our chronology in their heads. And you know the problem of chronology and time in a world, in any history class, in any history class. My last full year here at Stanford, Larry Cuban and I taught 11th grade US history together at Menlo Atherton High School at 8 o'clock every morning. And, uh, and it was 11th grade, so I think we began the Civil War. And I swear, for the first week, the kids thought that Larry and I were giving eyewitness accounts. <laughs> now, granted, by the, you know, well, no, I was still in my late 50s. Cuban, I think, had hit 60 by then. But, I mean, they just, you know, the Vietnam War, that was somewhere around Louis XIV, and these things really do get, but that something as simple as that. But now, that, was, that part of the iceberg had just momentarily elevated itself above sea level. What other things? The kid had read the text. And he was able to pass the quiz on the unit. And absent that little, she asked, anybody else have that problem? And about a quarter of the class raised their hands. They were puzzled by it too, but they wanted, didn't want to look stupid. I mean, the, 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 the reading of the text, I also remember a time, Pam, I think you were here already as a student, but I don't know if you were part of the group. Uh, a group went to see what was by then a fairly old movie called Days of Heaven. Everybody remember Days of Heaven? Sam Shepard, Richard Gere, most of you are much too young. Um, but the basic plot of the movie is that this guy accidentally kills a fellow factory worker and has to flee town with his girlfriend, a long-term girlfriend, and they finally hide out uh, at, a, at a very large farm, and the wealthy farmer hires them to work, and they think they'll be safe there for a while. But they tell the farmer that they're brother and sister. Okay? And the farmer immediately falls in love with her and wants to marry her. Yeah, that's what the movie's about. It becomes a love triangle and it gets very tragic. And, you know, Sam Shepard, these are pretty heavy stuff. Um, cinematography is to die for. Remember the cinematography? Unbelievable. But um, one of the graduate students who was in the group didn't get to the theater on time. It was Jill Baxter now teaches at the University of Oregon. She got there about 15 minutes late. We all left and went out to get coffee or something after the movie and began talking about the movie. Now, you know, during the movie, the boyfriend and girlfriend are often in the barn making out and talking about how they're going to get out from under the clutches of this rich farmer. Well, all the rest of us saw one movie. Jill saw a movie about incest. <laughs> now notice, it's like Martin Luther, Martin Luther King. It is how the absence or presence of one element that the author or writer or teacher assumes is already there as part of the cognitive Velcro with which the students are now going to grab onto a set of ideas isn't there. And so instead of it being grabbed onto, or grabbed onto and transformed, it goes Phew. And you end up talking about a movie you haven't seen. Except that sometimes our greatest challenge is how to teach our students and ourselves how to talk about movies or books that we're convinced we have seen and really understand, and don't need to learn anything more about. Here again, I remember early in my time at Stanford, teaching about the use, I was, it was an example of discovery learning, and I was teaching a section on how Jerome Bruner and some mathematicians used flat pieces of wood that were square and rectangular to teach third graders to build larger and larger squares systematically. And the kids didn't know that they were being taught 
the nature of quadratic equations. Because quadratic equations are really mathematical representations of how you make bigger and bigger squares. And I must have done it with them, a group of about 65 secondary students across the subject areas for about 30 minutes to illustrate the notion of discovery learning, how these third graders were discovering mathematical ideas without learning all the fancy notation that they wouldn't learn formally for many more years. A young man comes up to me at the end of the class, introduces himself, it was one of the earliest classes in the course, and says, I'm, uh, I'm somebody who got his degree in mathematics here at Stanford, and then I got a master's degree in engineering at MIT. But I kind of burned out as an engineer. I decided I really missed what I think I'm going to get as a math teacher. And so I'm back here to study to get a math, math certification and a math education master's degree. And I want to tell you something. I've known the quadratic equation and the quadratic formula since seventh grade. You give me a problem involving quadratics and I can solve them in a flash. This is the first time in my life I've ever understood the quadratic formula. It was making the connection across modes of representation. I mean, again, I couldn't get inside his head, but I've never forgotten that notion that in addition to the joy we get as teachers from teaching somebody something that they don't know is the joy of teaching them something that they thought they knew. And through working with us, they both realized they don't know it, but they also get a glimmer of understanding it more deeply. Well, let me make this connection between the going beyond the information given and the, the combination of the habituation, the routine, and the collective responsibility. Because I think they're both very germane to us as teachers. As Pam said about, oh my God, Pam, 25 years ago, my colleagues and I here at Stanford began designing and field testing what has become the National Board for Professional Teaching Standard Assessment, and actually the basis for the California packed assessment for graduating teachers. And the, the real innovation there is we decided after a year and a half of assessment development that the only way with integrity to assess the quality of veteran teaching was through a teaching portfolio that teachers developed in their own classrooms. Highly structured, highly mentored, graded, as it were, by their peers, but a portfolio that occurred in their own teaching context. And I'll never forget the first time I ever gave a talk about it, and a guy come up, came up to me, and he was then the director of teacher assessment for the state of Tennessee, a very able guy. And he said to me, Lee, I want to stop you before you waste too much more time with this. Uh, you can't use portfolios to evaluate the quality of teaching. I said, why not? He said, teachers cheat. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, they help each other out on their portfolios. <laughs> they show each other their work and they get advice from one another. Teachers cheat. So I said to him, just a second, do you have a PhD? He said, yeah. I said, did you have a doctoral committee for your dissertation? He said, sure. I said, so who were the members of the committee? And he proceeds to name you know, some very well-known people in the field with great pride. And I said, well, they didn't, they didn't help you with the dissertation, did they? they I mean, they, they didn't. He said, oh no, I mean, I would hand in a chapter, they would edit it, give it back to me, I had to rewrite it. I mean, and I said, ah, oh. 
so you cheated. <laughs> oh, well, that doesn't count for well, What do we end up doing? We ended up introducing into our protocol for what became the National Board the idea of national, what became National Board support groups. Anybody here from the National Board support group? Hi, how are you, Sandy Dean? Oh, one of my very favorite people in the world. Uh, I still remember that video that Judy did of you where you said you just had a National Board day. Yes. No, I mean, the whole notion that we've now learned in the research over the years that teachers who undertake National Board certification will almost uniformly attest that the preparation for board certification because of the way other teachers and they looked at each other's videos and their portfolio entries and their student work and everything was the most powerful professional development they ever experienced in their lives. That was the idea. And so instead of teachers cheat, the idea was teachers learn from preparing for board certification. And the only thing that makes me sad, and which I think we learn from the example of the collective reciprocal responsibility that moves the health statistics of hospitals ahead is that it shouldn't end with board certification. That this notion of being reciprocally responsible for the quality of one another's work, that if we teach in a school, we are all responsible for what goes on in our grade and in third grade and in fifth grade and in sixth grade because they are students in the school and we are members of a teaching profession. And if we saw and learned that surgeons were ignoring the poor practice of other surgeons, we would get ticked off beyond belief. This, I think, is part of the more universal message. So I, uh, I guess I end my remarks today with as I do regularly, marveling at how you manage. Of how you manage day in and day out, engaging in this remarkable profession that requires on the one hand the routines and the habits and the discipline dare I say, of a drill sergeant? No, 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 of a surgeon. And the adaptiveness and responsiveness and spontaneity of a great performer who has to perform a lot of the time without a script, not to mention without a net. Uh, and contrary to the stereotypes we all live with, here you are, more than 250 of you, when the stereotype says that you're all out, sitting on the beach, reading pot boilers, and watching, I guess Oprah's off now, but whatever <laughs> the equivalent is, and you're reinvesting and the extraordinary resources that you need and that we as a society need for you to have uh, to do this job. I don't know how to calculate the number of minds and hearts and souls that are lost from school-born educational infections. I do know that they're high. They're just not as dramatic and visible as the ones that we can report for the hospital-borne infections. But I'm pretty confident that like the ones in the hospitals, we actually know a lot of what we need to know to put into practice to cut those losses down, if not to zero, dramatically lower than they are now. And you are the cutting edge. You're the folks that are going to take the leadership in this role and I can only hope that next year each of you will have attracted at least one more to this effort so that ultimately, Pam, you have to teach this program 
in the basketball stadium. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.